Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today's video topic is a much requested one because we're going to take a look at the life, rule and legacy of King William II. He is though perhaps more often referred to, maybe better known as William Rufus. And I think it's fair to say that if or indeed when people are asked to name their favourite monarch from history, William II's name is unlikely to come up all that often. And perhaps this can be explained, at least in part, because his legacy, his rule, has been overshadowed in the historical record by that of his father. I mean, actually, I'd argue that it's hardly a reasonable expectation for a son to match or even eclipse a father whom history has chosen to remember as the Conqueror but I'm looking forward to seeing what you think about this. Now, though, I think it's time for us to explore what we know about King William II. Let's see if we can bring him out of his father's shadow today. William Rufus was born in around 1060. So just a few years before his father, William, Duke of Normandy, would fight and ultimately win the throne of England. William Rufus was his parents' third son. He followed Robert, who was known as Kurt Hose, and Richard. There would be at least one other brother after him who was called Henry. And he also had at least five sisters, Adelaida, Cecilia, Matilda, Constance, and Adela. The nickname Rufus probably tells us something about his appearance. It is thought to be an indication that he may have had red hair, or possibly a ruddy complexion, or maybe both. William of Malmesbury, who was writing a couple of decades after William Rufus's death, offers the following description of him. He was, apparently, quote, well set, his complexion florid, his hair yellow, of open countenance, different coloured eyes, varying with certain glittering specks of astonishing strength, not very tall, and his belly rather projecting. It is suggested that William Rufus and his siblings were all fairly short, that while their father, William the Conqueror, stood at around 5 foot 8 inches tall, his wife, the mother of his children, Matilda, was probably around 5 feet, or 152 centimetres tall. Although there are some sources that claim that she was as small as 127 centimetres, or 4 feet 2. However tall, or indeed short, William Rufus and his siblings were, it does seem that all of them enjoyed pretty good health. Every one of them survived into at least their late teens or early twenties. William Rufus and his brothers were all keen on and skilled in the traditional physical pursuits of medieval male royals and nobles. And so, days were spent in the saddle, as they rode around their father's dominions hunted in his forests, and fought to defend his borders and authority. There is a suggestion that William Rufus was placed in a monastic household for his education, with the implication being that the plan was for this third son to pursue a career in the church. However, less than a decade after the conquest of England, Rufus's brother, Richard, who was his parents' second son, died in a hunting accident in the New Forest. And for those of you who are familiar with Rufus's own fate, you might have pricked up your ears at the mention of that new forest hunting accident. Never fear, we will get there in due course. After the death of his brother Richard, it is believed that Rufus would have returned to his father's household, where he would have begun to undertake the customary nightly training. Rufus would prove to be a rambunctious teen, and indeed adult. His early exit from that potential ecclesiastical career was, it is said, likely a relief to all concerned. Rufus's relationship with the church would be a contemptuous one, due in part to Rufus's perceived mockery and disrespect of that institution for much of his life. However, it was not only the clergy that found themselves on the receiving end of this mockery and disrespect. On an occasion, when Rufus joined his father and brothers on a military campaign in around 1078, he and his younger brother Henry were at the accommodation of their elder brother, Robert, 
who was in his 20s and had been left for some years as his father's representative in Normandy and Men. Quite how much power he actually wielded in this role is, however, hotly debated. While Robert was sat with his friends, the story goes that Rufus, who was aged around 18 at this time, and his brother Henry, at that point aged around 10, made their way up to a room above where Robert and his group of friends were sitting. Presumably, this upper room was open in some way onto the space below, because from that spot, these younger brothers were able to apparently urinate on those below. Another account claims that a chamber pot was emptied on them from above. Robert was, I think understandably, reportedly furious. He rushed up and a fight broke out. Apparently this fight was bad enough that there was seen to be no other alternative than for their father to come and break it up. When he arrived, he would enforce his sons to make peace with each other. Robert was embarrassed. He was left unsatisfied following this intervention by his father and so he left his father's side. He soon became disruptive and rebellious. Rufus, however, remained beside his father, assisting him in his attempts to bring his elder brother Robert to heel. The two Williams ended up besieging Robert at Gerbois around a year after that unfortunate urine incident. The Williams were both injured in this fighting. Indeed, William the Conqueror was wounded by his son Robert himself. Robert would, however, come to terms with his father in 1080, just in time for him to journey to England with him and with his brother Rufus, from where they collectively launched campaigns to subdue South Wales and also to pacify the King of Scots, who had been attacking William's northern shires. This group later returned to Normandy together, where they secured that duchy and saw off the invasion of men by Fulk of Anjou, which all sounds very positive, doesn't it? But This familial cooperation should, I think, arguably not be viewed as evidence of renewed or indeed ongoing harmonious relations. In 1083, Robert would leave Normandy and his family. It's thought he spent his time visiting the Low Countries and Italy. All the while, Rufus remained with his father. And it's often said that Rufus was his father's favourite, and he may well have been. I mean, after all, it wasn't Rufus that had pulled William off his horse and wounded him. In 1087, William the Conqueror was sacking the town of Mont when he was taken gravely ill. It may have been that he was afflicted by the heat, or perhaps, as some accounts state, he was somehow impaled on the pommel of his saddle in a manner that caused a fatal injury. It sounds very nasty all around. As William lay dying for weeks, he was reportedly competent and coherent enough to make his wishes about his lands, his dominions, known. Exactly what he wanted is, however, still debated. What we do know is what happened. His eldest son, Robert, got Normandy. His second surviving son, William Rufus, got England. And perhaps this was a way to punish that rebellious eldest son and to reward his loyal and trusted one. According to the De Obertu Wilhelmai, this dying king had originally intended to deny his son, Robert, any inheritance at all and had to be won round by the Archbishop of Rouen to see him handed Normandy. However, William Rufus's future as King of England may well have been as much about their father recognising that splitting up his dominions between his two sons was, in fact, the best way to keep both of them in the family. Is it possible that he didn't trust either of them to hold the entire dominion together? Did he perhaps recognise that the distrust and animosity that existed between these brothers, his sons, meant that neither of them would support the other if they ruled over a combined Anglo-Norman territory? That it was instead better to give each of them a base from where they could hopefully sort themselves out? It's also worth pointing out that male preference primogeniture had not been the unquestioned tradition in England previously to this. With a couple of days left to live, William the Conqueror sent William Rufus to England with, as Frank Barlow explains, quote, a letter addressed to Lanfranc, Archbishop of Canterbury, and possibly the royal regalia. Then Rufus, with a small retinue, sailed probably from Tork to the Hampshire or Sussex coast, made for Winchester to secure the royal treasure, and within a fortnight, on the 26th of September, was crowned King of England by Lanfranc in Westminster Abbey. It was a coup d'etat, legitimised by unction and investiture, 
and made possible only by Rufus's audacity and Lanfranc's decisive action in deference to the conqueror's wishes. King William II, as he now was, would have to see off challenges to his rule. Less than a year after he took the English throne, in the spring of 1088, his elder brother Robert's supporters had prepared their English strongholds and were now awaiting the invasion of their new king's elder brother. These supporters included their uncle, Odo, Bishop of Bayeux. He had been imprisoned on the orders of their father, William the Conqueror, but had subsequently been released and restored to wealth and prominence by the new king, who they were now all rebelling against. William Rufus was, however, able to mobilise his own troops and swiftly put down this rebellion. In early 1091, William would launch his own invasion against his brother Robert in Normandy. Robert found himself forced to agree to terms that essentially divided this duchy between the two of them. In doing so, they excluded and effectively disinherited their younger brother Henry. William and Robert then worked together to force Henry to comply to the deal they had made with each other. By the spring of 1091, Henry found himself compelled to leave Normandy with the promise of safe conduct. For the better part of a decade, this little brother would observe the fractious relationship between his elder brothers and so would flit between them, seeking his own advantage wherever it lay. In the summer of 1091, Rufus and Robert, apparently still getting along well enough, travelled to England to deal with unrest in Wales and also a northern invasion by the King of Scots. This King of Scots would ultimately end up paying homage and swearing fealty to Rufus. However, Robert and Rufus seem to have fallen out again by the end of that same year. In May 1090, Rufus invaded Cumbria and reset the northern border of England. At this point, Carlisle became English once again. Despite Rufus's evident military skill and recognised bravery, it does seem that he had a public image problem, at least in some quarters. His love of fashionable dress, which included apparently short tunics and curled-toed poulain shoes, inspired consternation in his critics. He was quick to anger, fond of vengeance and puffed up with pride, so they said. William of Malmesbury recounts Rufus's rageful reaction to a servant who brought him a pair of shoes that apparently cost only a shilling. He is said to have berated the man, shouting, quote, You son of a whore, since when has a king got to wear shoes as cheap as that? Go and buy me some for a mark of silver, which in fairness does seem like an overreaction. Some monastic writers, like William of Malmesbury, would insinuate various things about William Rufus's behaviour, his character and his morals. His dress they viewed as excessive, even effeminate. They commented similarly on his preference for wearing his hair long and parted down the middle. It was insinuated that he was lecherous and that his amorous desires were directed towards both men and women. However, he never married. There are no recorded bastards, nor are there any named lovers, neither male nor female. He was reputed to be, though, a habitual blasphemer. Some went further, insinuating that he was in fact an atheist or heretic. He is said to have mocked the idea that trials by ordeal, meaning judicial combat, where two individuals take to an arena and fight each other to see who is in the right, who is the innocent, who is the guilty, but also something that might include deliberately injuring a person to see how their wound heals, whether it festers or not because the idea was that the truly innocent person would be unharmed through the grace of God. It is said that William Rufus was challenging whether this could possibly be a fair way to achieve justice. He also sought to challenge ecclesiastical power and authority. For example, he questioned the requirement that churchmen who were accused of crimes could expect to only be tried in ecclesiastical courts. And that might sound familiar because I have made other videos where this issue comes up. I will leave some relevant ones linked. Because William Rufus would certainly not be the first or last person or indeed the last monarch of this land to challenge the notion of what would become known as benefit of clergy. For that was an issue that would stretch out across the centuries. Additionally, this king was happy to profit from the church whenever possible. 
And I can see how perhaps that may well have fostered some ill will towards him, particularly from people within the church. For example, when L'Enfranc, the Archbishop of Canterbury, died on the 28th of May 1089, this king held out on permitting anyone to succeed L'Enfranc to that office. This, in turn, allowed William Rufus to take the See of Canterbury's lands and revenues into his own hands and use them to fill his own coffers. Rufus would hold out on this until 1093, and the reason for his change of mind, change of heart, will become apparent very shortly. But at this point, he chose Anselm of Beck to be elevated to this particular archbishopric. Borrowing some brief spells of peace, this Anselm was in near constant conflict with both William Rufus and with his successor as king. However, Rufus would seek the advice and counsel of prominent ecclesiastical figures, so he did have, clearly, some friends. He provided well for monasteries, and at a time when he believed himself to be dying, that moment in 1093, he, as Barlow puts it, quote, made abject submission to the church. It was to Anselm that he confessed at this time, and it was in this moment of crisis that he chose to nominate Anselm to be the new Archbishop of Canterbury. It's also worth pointing out that when they sought to compare him with his brother Robert, arguably the other option, that for all Rufus's failings and foibles, it does seem that the majority of the church saw Rufus from the very start of his reign in England as being a blockade to near certain anarchy. Rufus would also struggle with rebellious barons. Indeed, he would need to put down their uprising in 1095. When it came to his government, it was very much a continuation and a consolidation of that which had been developed by his father. And before long, Rufus would be controlling the same territories as dear old dad too. When Robert joined the First Crusade in 1096, he was in desperate need of funds and so he approached his brother Rufus who, as Kathleen Thompson explains, quote, advanced 10,000 marks of silver against control of the duchy to cover Robert's crusading expenses. And so Robert duly set off, leaving his brother in command of Normandy. Robert and Rufus would never see one another again. William Rufus returned to England at Easter 1099. The following year, on the 2nd of August 1100, while Robert was still one month away from returning to Normandy, Rufus and his younger brother Henry were part of a royal hunting party in the New Forest, the place where not only Rufus and Henry's elder brother Richard, but also their nephew, by Robert, born out of wedlock, also called Richard, had died accidentally while hunting. That's two family members dead in hunting accidents in the New Forest, just wanting to flag that up. Clearly, though, this was not omen enough either for Rufus or for Henry, because on this day, in the afternoon, the brothers and their friends took up their positions with the intention of bringing down a deer. Instead, it was King William II who was struck in the heart with an apparently stray arrow. Walter Tyrrell, Count of Poix, is commonly named as being the responsible person. However, he would later swear that he was not in the king's company that day, and also that he was absolutely not responsible for his death. As it was, no one was punished for his demise. Perhaps this was because it was really an accident, as had apparently been the case with those two related Richards. However, it could also be a sign that an assassin was being protected by the person who had commissioned this killing. More recent historians have suggested that Henry, ordered the premeditated murder of his brother and king in order to give him time to secure the throne of England for himself, while his elder brother Robert was still safely out of the way, having not yet returned from that crusade. And certainly, Henry acted very swiftly indeed and arranged his coronation to occur just three days later, on the 5th of August, 1100. This was around a month before Robert would return to Normandy. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle memorialised King William II and his reign in the following way, quote, He was very harsh and severe over his land and his men, and with all his neighbours, and very formidable, and through the counsels of evil men, that to him were always agreeable, and through his own avarice he was ever tiring this nation with an army, 
and with unjust contributions. For in his days, all right fell to the ground, and every wrong rose up before God and before the world. God's church he humbled, and all the bishoprics and abbacies whose elders fell in his days he either sold in fee or held in his own hands, and let for a certain sum, because he would be the heir of every man, both of the clergy and laity, so that on the day that he fell he had in his own hand the Archbishopric of Canterbury, with the Bishopric of Winchester and that of Salisbury, and eleven abbacies all let for a sum. And though I may be tedious, all that was loathsome to God and righteous men, all that was customary in this land in his time, and for this he was loathed by nearly all his people, and odious to God as his end testified, for he departed in the midst of his unrighteousness, without any power of repentance or recompense for his deeds. The last part of that quotation may, for some of us, appear a bit murky. Why is it that death in a hunting accident is somehow a sign that William was odious to God? How did that death prevent him from having any power of repentance or recompense for his deeds, as the quotation says? I think to understand this more fully, we need to look at the medieval, indeed the early modern notion as well, of the in quotes good death. And part of a good death was getting the chance to make your final confession to have your last rites, to receive extreme unction. Death in an accident, rather than dying in your bed of perhaps a protracted illness, prevents this. And without those things, without that cleansing preparation, without the assistance and succour of a priest to prepare a living person to enter into, hopefully, an eternal life of peace, there was the thought that perhaps that eternal life of peace might not come. Is this chronicler saying that God doesn't think that William deserves it? But what do you think of William Rufus, of his life, rule and legacy? Do you think his death was an accident? Was he cursed by God? Or do you think Henry was behind it? What do you think of those reports of him, like the ones we've just talked about in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement, and the more engagement video gets, the more YouTube says they share it out. That will, hopefully, help us to grow this community. As we've been talking about William Rufus, maybe some medieval castles? He was quite good at fighting, so maybe some swords? I'm looking forward to seeing what you pick. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, please do share it with your friends. If you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me that this video was one for you in particular by hitting the thumbs up please do subscribe to my channel. And if you think you are subscribed, please have a little check now. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will, because I have once again been getting reports people have checked and they found themselves to be unsubscribed. So while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will appear. And that way, YouTube claims that they will tell you when I've next uploaded. We do, of course, have a failsafe. Head over to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. I will leave it linked. If you go over to the contact page, you'll find this box. Put your email in the box. That will add you to my mailing list. And that way, once a week, I will send you out an email to let you know what I've been up to and also to send you useful links for the coming days. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.